can play copyright music, not even in the background.
Hello, Abby. Can you hear me? Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm okay. That's it. Let me unpin myself. You doing a lot of talking? Yep. <laughs> where 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 have you been speaking? We had this meeting on Saturday, right? Okay. So, okay. Which was that? Here. Which one? Uh, it was an Indian meeting organized here. She oh, okay. Was anatomy with live dissection. Oh, how'd that go? Okay. Yeah, it went great. Good. No, I think I missed that one. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> some I can connect to, some I can't, you know. Okay, yeah. No, this one, I think uh, you would need some special permission, probably. Otherwise, yeah. I would have told you. Good day, Harshad. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you today? I'm fine, all well. Looking forward to hear something. <laughs> Say hello to Hi. Abby. Say hello Abhi, to Abhi. Abhi is our uh, great uh, doctor there in Bombay. And she has got a lot of information to give to all of us. <laughs> well, Thank you, well, sir. Well, she's so hey. excited. She can't sleep. She's been given that studio. She just can't sleep until since she's yeah. Left. Right, yeah, Abby? Yeah. You can't yeah. sleep. Yeah. <laughs> she she walks through the brains. <laughs> she hey, walks Muhammad, through and you? runs through the brains. You know Muhammad, right, Abby? Hi. Yes, yes, Hi, John. Hi. Hi, Hi Abby. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm good. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. there anyone you want to introduce, uh, Mohammed? Uh, uh, <coughs> an attending or something? Mohammed, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. John. Did you want to introduce somebody? Not now, but when we start. Oh, yes. Uh, is your mentor here? Uh, he, he'll, very soon he'll join us. Okay, if he is, just introduce him, okay? If, if not, okay. that's fine. I'll yeah. introduce you. Okay. Okay, we start in three minutes, Abby. Yep. Yes. You know, we went to, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my camera on. Um, we had a good webcast. Muhammad was there. Wasn't that great, Muhammad? All those yeah. minds uh, talking, discussing. We had Yuha, uh, Pascal Jabour, uh, Ricardo Hanel and Luis uh, Lopez Ibor discussing ruptured aneurysms. It was great. Interesting. Very, very excellent discussion that was going on. Uh, very good presentation on basically on complication. <laughs> ruptured aneurysm is a complication. So we usually uh, used to see the complication, microvascular complication, ruptured aneurysm management, but how it has been managed with endovascular way during endovascular procedure. That has been shown very, very excellent. This is going to be a regular feature, right, John, endovascular? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be. Uh, every two weeks, at least. I'm trying to convince them to do it every week, uh, but um, to build the community, you know? Yeah. But um, because I think there's a pretty extensive community of neurointerventional radiologists around the world. And the internet's a good way to get all these people together. So we'll see how it how it does. But in two weeks, yeah, we're going to have another webcast. Yuha participates too because I guess he's he is, he's a believer in that aspect of it that it has some uses. How about you? Do you have you done much of that at all, or that's something different? No, no, I do that. Oh, you do that? Oh, okay. Where were you? <laughs> Sir, we had a whole Mumbai city was in, had a power outrage. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the okay. The lights got on back pretty late. But it's okay now, obviously. Yeah, yeah now it's okay. <laughs> Hi, sir. How are you, sir? Shuresh Naif, sir. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you, sir? Good evening, everywhere. Because I don't know. John is in U.S., no? And <laughs> Abida is yeah. in uh, dinner time. And I know Mohammed. Yeah, it is your good night time. So, yeah. uh, okay, looking forward to another great show from Abida. Yeah. Thank the you. last uh, time it was excellent. 
Today we are going to have another excellent show. Uh, limbic, limbic system. So we just more of uh, a clinical application for neurosystem. So looking forward to another great. Okay, Abby, you ready to start? You got a minute here. Yeah, let, me, let me get some last min, minute entrance here and here. Yeah, I keep forgetting this is neuroanatomy TV, not neurosurgical. Okay, here we go. Let me unpin myself. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning from Miami Beach, home of neuroanatomy TV, sister to neurosurgical TV. Today, we're graced with the presence of uh, Abby Shah. She's a neurosurgeon and a neuroanatomist. Uh, and this is her second uh, presentation, and she's going to do more. Uh, but first, let me introduce uh, Muhammad from... Uh, <coughs> from Bangladesh, who's uh, collaborating with us. Hello, Mohammed. Can you hear me, Mohammed? Oh, perhaps not. <laughs> OK, Abby, that wasn't not very successful. I uh, think he'll, he'll join soon. I'm Dr. Shofi. OK, I, I didn't catch that. OK, Abby, it's all yours. OK. Okay, screen visible, John? Yes, beautiful. Okay. So let's continue with the second phase of second lecture about intrinsic brain anatomy. And today we are going to discuss the limbic system, PAPE circuit, and approaches for mesial temporal surgery. So this complex structure that you see here is your whole limbic system. It's quite a complex structure because it has many intricate connections that we don't normally see or visualize while we are operating on the brain. But it is vital to understand these connections because if you sever them, then you're going to have quite a lot of neuro deficits. Not maybe motor deficits or not sensory deficits, but emotional deficits, memory disturbances, which will disturb your everyday to day life. So this structure that you see here is made up of many, many connections of the limbic system. But basically, if you can see, there are a series of C's here. There are a series of rings within one, one another. We will see all these rings one by one. So this is one ring. This is another ring. This is the third ring. And there are other two rings in the middle of the uh, medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, which we will see slowly. So looking at this aspect, it looks quite complex. Let's try to simplify it a little bit. So to begin with, embryologically, the brain in primitive fishes was just a spinal cord, a brain stem, a hypothalamus, and a corpus striatum. As the primitive fishes left the sea and they became amphibians, they developed an olfactory system. This olfactory system increased as the evolution proceeded. And you see long olfactory systems in many of the animals that we have now. In mammals, what happened was, along next to the corpus striatum, you had two structures that developed, the amygdala and the hippocampus medially, and the olfactory or the pyriform cortex laterally. This was the primitive cortex, and it was made up of three layers, also called as the allocortex. And these were classically called as the limbic structures. Medial to the amygdala and the hippocampus, an intermediate layer started forming, an intermediate ring. And this had six layers, but they were not organized six layers. And they formed the parahippocampal gyrus and the cingulate gyrus on the medial aspect. And on the lateral aspect, you had the insula. The insula forms an external shield of the central core, as we saw in last time's lecture. And as the organization progressed, you had the neocortex or the isocortex, which constituted the para-insular structures and all the neocortex that we see on the cerebral hemisphere. So the limbic system has been known as the most complex and the least understood part of the nervous system. Why is it called limbus, limbic? Limbus means border or margin. It developed at the border of the medial aspect of the hemisphere, thus giving it, it its name. 
First, it was referred to as the Limbus by Thomas Willis in 1664. In 1878, Roca called it the gland lobe limbic. In this, he, in, he saw that the cingulate gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus, as we will see, formed a continuous C-shaped ring. And earlier, they were not classified as two separate gyri. It was classified as one big lobe, which was called as the grand lobe limbic. And the sulci that separated these lobes from the other, other gyri of the hemisphere were called as the limbic fissure, which included the callosal sulcus and the uh, pro pre -center, pre uh, just the sulcus beneath the precuneus and the sulcus that calcarine sulcus that in, went into the temporal aspect of the brain. So this was called the Lagrand lobe limbic. Now McLean in 1949 added more connections to this limbic system. He added cortical, subcortical, and more fiber connections, and he started calling it the limbic system. Nota, by the means of silver degeneration studies, extended the limits of the limbic system to include the midbrain. And now, as we know it, the limbic system includes cortex, cortical, subcortical systems that connect the hypothalamus and that connect to the brainstem and the lower part of the brain. Basically, how the limbic system differs from your motor system. When you have a motor sensory system connects basically to your corticostriatal pathway, your limbic system connects more to the hypothalamus. It gives connection to the hypothalamus and not through the basal ganglia. So that is the basic difference between your limbic connections and your connections with the motor and the sensory cortex. One is through the basal ganglia and the connections of the limbic system are completely through the hypothalamus. So Pape circuit forms the most important component of your limbic system. It is not the only component, but it is a very significant component of the uh, limbic system. So we're going to dissect it one by one. It was originally described by Pape's, who postulated that the anatomical basis of the motor <coughs> was found in the hypothalamus, anteriothalamic nuclei, cingulate gyrus, hippocampus, and its interconnections. And the whole circuit that was described by him, as we will see it now, was called the Pape circuit. We, we did this study way back in 2009 and published this paper. It was one of a kind, and it is a very highly cited paper. So to begin the dissection, of course, you have to prepare the brain. As we discussed last time, the brain is frozen and formalin fixed, and the Klingler method of dissection was used for study. The tools that were used were basically handmade, thin, wooden, and curved metallic spatul spatulas. Basically, we used these ice cream spoons that you have when you're having an ice cream candy, and we shaped it into various sizes and various thickness to perform the dissection. To begin the dissection of this limbic system, of course, you have to start from the medial side. So this is the medial aspect of the hemisphere, and you see the corpus callosum in all its glory. You have the rostrum, the genu, the body, and the splenium of the corpus callosum. The hemisphere has been cut more towards my side, so you cannot see the septum and the nuclei that are on the other side of the septum. <clears throat> so the components of the limbic system are noted here. So the gray matter components are the hippocampal formation, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens, the cingulate. There are areas of the prefrontal or the orbitofrontal cortex and nuclei of the midbrain. The white mitre connections of the limbic system are the cingulum, the longitudinal stri, the fornix, the anterior commissure, mammulothalamic and mammulotegmental tracts, the stri terminalis, the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, the medial forebrain bundle, and you have the fasciculus retroflexus. So we'll start now. This is an image that we are very familiar with. This is your uh, ependyma covering the lateral ventricle. This is your corpus callosum. This is your fornix. This is the choroid plexus in your choroidal fissure, which is surrounding the thalamus here. This is the cut part of the midbrain here. This structure that is projecting towards you is the anterior commissure. Embryologically, you have to understand one thing. The hippocampus originally was a supracallosal structure. So as the hemisphere developed and attained its c shape. So basically, when embryologically you notice the brain, you had a brain stem, and above the midbrain, you had the thalamus. So your whole cerebral hemisphere developed as a C around the thalamus, and all the structures on the medial aspect of this 
went along with the sea and the medial medial best port of it is the limbic system so what is this this is the superior surface of the corpus callosum you see a thin layer of gray matter here this is the indusium griseum so this indusium griseum is actually a remnant of that supracallosal part of the hippocampus so as the hippocampus moved down migrated into the temporal lobe it left some part of its portion above superiorly above the corpus callosum this part is called as the indusium griseum and below the corpus callosum this part is the fornix so when the hippocampus moved down it carried along with it its whole tail continuing as the fornix and then the corpus callosum invaded just above the fornix so it separated the indusium griseum above from the fornix below so technically they are all components of the hippocampus but have been separated by the invading fibers of the corpus callosum so this gray matter that you see here is the indusium griseum i will show you how it connects anteriorly and posteriorly in the other images within the indusium griseum there are two longitudinal stri they are white matter tracts they are called as the medial and lateral longitudinal stri of lancisi and along with the indusium griseum they connect to the subcallosal area and they connect the hippocampus to the subcallosal area so as you go in the depths you see this region that i have started dissecting here now this structure first that you see here is the mammillary body as you core out the gray matter of the hypothalamus you start seeing the mammillothalamic tract so this is the mammillary bo mammillary body there is one tract that goes up that is the mammillothalamic tract and one tract that goes down that is the mammillotegmental tract which connects to the tegmental nucleus of gudel in the midbrain so this fornix which is coming down from the hippocampus as you can see here it is curving around the hypothalamus with the choroidal fissure in between running down as the columns of the fornix just behind the anterior commissure terminating in the mammillary body and which going which is going up to form the mammillothalamic tract so this is one component of the papish circuit this region here that you see here this labeled as a and b is the subcallosal region so this is your region where the indusium griseum and the lateral longitudinal stri coming over the corpus callosum run and end in this region here why is this region important because this area harbors the septal nuclei so septal nuclei is your true septum and the septum pellucidum which is actually devoid of any neuronal fibers is just a thin layer of thin sheet that you can that is seen here and the septal nuclei lie in this region of the subcallosal gyri which we will see later again <clears throat> the that you see here is the caudate head the septum has been removed the ependyma of the lateral ventricle also has been removed and we'll go further so we have dissected this portion of the of the papish circuit now let's look at the next major component and that is the cingulum so the cingulum can be visualized after removing the gray matter of the cingulate gyrus so it runs above the callosal sulcus and just beneath the cingulate sulcus it begins here in the subcallosal area runs above the genu hugging the genu of the corpus callosum runs above the corpus callosum and ends here coming back into the parahippocampal region as the radiation of the cingulum along its route it has connections to the parietal cortices it has connections to the frontal cortices and this is how the limbic system communicates with your higher cortical cerebral hemisphere so this is another image showing the cingulum that is running from the subcallosal region right up to the posterior aspect of the splenium here another thing is in the posterior aspect of the splenium here the cingulum narrows down and it forms the it is called as the isthmus of the cingulum there is another structure here of note this is your caudate head this is your thalamus there is a thin tract that runs here between the caudate and the thalamus it is it is the stria terminalis it ends here in the bed nucleus of the stria and turning around forming a c it goes all the way up to, up to the amygdala i will show you that in another image later so coming back to this image we have dissected this portion of the papish circuit so you have the cingulum here which is running into the radiation of the cingulum in the parahippocampal region you have the fornix which is coming and running and becoming the columns of the fornix here going to the mammillary body mammillothalamic tract and the anterior nucleus of the thalamus 
So the next structure that we will see is the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is part of the hippocampal formation. Hippocampal formation is consists of the hippocampus proper or the Ammon's horn and the dentate gyrus. So the hippocampus proper, this anterior portion of the hippocampus or the head of the hippocampus has a paw-like shape and it is also has, has some serrations on it which look resemble that of a feline paw and it is known as pest hippocampi. And the word hippocampus is derived from seahorse because of its resemblance. So the hippocampus is divided into the head, the body and the tail. Then you have a thin layer of white matter that begins here in the region of the hippocampus and that is the alveus. The alveus continues as the fimbri of the fornix, which then continues as the crura, the body, the columns of the fornix going into the mammillary body. And this, as you see, the structure is lying in the medial part of the temporal horn. This is the temporal horn that you see here. So now let's see the anatomy from the medial aspect of the hemisphere. So this is your cingulate gyrus here. So beginning in the subcalosal region, going all the way and becoming connecting here with the parahippocampal gyrus. The parahippocampal gyrus also connects here with the lingual gyrus. Both are separated by the parieto-occipital sulcus. The isthmus of the cingulum, which we saw in the dissected specimen, is in this region, and it just lies anterior to the division here of the calcarine fissure. The parahippocampus continues here and bends medially bends on itself medially and that forms the uncus. So now extrapolating from that image, as we saw above, this is the cingulum that is running about the corpus callosum and coming down here as the radiation of the cingulum, the gray of the parahippocampal gyrus has now been removed. And here you can now start seeing the head of the hippocampus. So this is the head of the hippocampus forming the fimbria of the fornix in this region, which is going up as the crura of the fornix the body of the fornix, the columns of the fornix, the mammillary body, and the mammillothalamic tract, ending here as seen very clearly in the anterior thalamic nucleus. Now, this structure here that you can see running just lateral to the fimbria is your dentate gyrus. You can see the denticulations, and that gives it its name. Now, you remember I told you the inducium crisium. So, what happens is some fibers of the fimbria some fibers of the dentate gyrus go here, run here beneath the, beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum, forming the subsplenial gyrus, and they run above and form that thin layer that is known as the inducium grisium, go over the corpus callosum and connect all the way here to the subcallosal region. So this is your first circuit of your limbic system outside of the pape circuit, and it forms the most outer ring of your limbic system. From the subcallosal region running all the way connecting to the hippocampus. Now let's coming back to the papage circuit. So now we have the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus has been removed here. You can see the fimbria very clearly going on to form the fornix and the mammillary body and mammillothalamic tract. This structure here running right in front of the fornix is your anterior commissure. Now the fornix divides into two parts. You have the pre-commissural fornix and the post-commissural fornix. The post-commissural fornix you can see here entering into the mammillary body. Most of these fibers end here, end here in the mammillary body. The fornix is the efferent pathway of your hippocampus. So all your connections from the hippocampus are mainly traveling through the fornix. Now, as I said, there is a pre-commissural fornix. It is a very thin and small layer, which is generally not dissectable on gross anatomical specimens. But what it does it is connects the fornix to the septal nuclei in the region of the septum that we saw, subcallosal region. So you have a pre-commissural fornix, you have a post-commissural fornix. Also, there are some fibers that connect directly from the fornix to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So in case of any injury to this area, there is an alternate pathway available that connects the fornix to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Now we've reached the anterior thalamic nucleus. Now to go further, to see how this connects further, you have to I have cut the corpus callosum here and you see the head of the caudate nucleus. So what we do is we disconnect the caudate nucleus and lift it completely from the lateral ventricle floor. And you start seeing some fiber bundles in this region. These are the fibers of the anterior thalamic radiations. So now you can see them more clearly. So these fibers start from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus 
they run here beneath the corpus beneath the caudate head and they run ahead and form join the cingulum so that is another important constituent of the papay circuit so now if you see we have the whole papay circuit disconnected here we start at the hippocampus you have the fimbria you have the fornix you have the columns of the fornix the mammillary body the mammillothalamic tract the anterior nucleus of thalamus the anterior thalamic radiations going to the cingulum which turns back and comes back to the parahippocampus as the radiation of the cingulum so this is the basic papay circuit now how does the papay circuit connect to the cortex we have seen by it has connections with the precuneus by the parietal connection and it also has a strong connection with the superior frontal gyrus as a frontal connection so this is the whole papay circuit that has been dissected outside again you can see the hippocampus the fornix mammillary body mammillothalamic tract anterior thalamic radiation the cingulum and coming back here now this is the third component of your limbic system so now we have seen an outer ring which connects your subcalosal region to the hippocampus by the indusium crisium and the dentate gyrus and the tail of the dentate gyrus and the tail of the hippocampus you have another ring that is the main mainly the papay circuit which you have seen here completely dissected and then you have a third region you have the basal forebrain region which connects to your amygdala and your prepyriform cortex and that forms your third ring of your limbic connections so this is the olfactory bulb tract and the stri the medial and the lateral stri so now we have finished the papay circuit and the outer ring now let's look at this olfactory connections and the connections of the amygdala so this is your basal basal forebrain region the basal surface of your uh, frontal brain which is divided by the h shaped cruciform sulcus of rolando into the medial the lateral the anterior and posterior orbital gyri this is your olfactory sulcus this is your gyrus rectus now the olfactory tract divides into the lateral and the medial olfactory stri also another important connection that you note here is that the posterior orbital gyrus always connects with the medial orbital gyrus in the region of the posterior and this region is called the posterior medial orbital lobule there is also another cingulate pole which i forgot to show you i will show you in the another in further away in the lecture so coming back to the base of the brain so you see this olfactory stri dividing into the lateral and the medial olfactory stri this structure that you start seeing here is your anterior commissure now what does the what do these structures border these structures border your anterior perforated substance the anterior perforated substance has its name because of these multiple perforations of the lenticular striate arteries that you can see as they enter from the anterior perforated substance so now this is the next area that is your important constituent of your <coughs> limbic system so basically this anterior perforated substance has as its boundaries the medial and the lateral olfactory stri posteriorly it has the optic tract medially it goes right up to the interhemispheric fissure and laterally it goes up to the amygdala and the prepyriform cortex so this is your anterior perforated substance now the ventral forebrain the ventral striatum lies between the anterior commissure on top and the anterior perforated substance at its base so once you start removing the anterior perforated substance you start seeing this gray matter in this region this region was synonymously known the whole region was synonymously known as the substantia innominata so what does it have so here you have the anterior commissure you have some fibers of the uncinate fasciculus we'll i will show you later as the inferior origin of the uncinate fasciculus and the inferior origin of the i fof as it is going to join the limen insulae this is your region of your anterior commissure this gray matter that you see here has the nucleus basalis of menert it has some components where the globus pallidus and the caudate and the putamen connect with each other and that is why this region is known as the ventral striatum and you have the anterior commissure now there is this structure that you see here which is running right in front of your optic tract i had told you last time i will try to show you this is your diagonal band of broca what is that that is your ventral amygdalo fugal pathway so this is your if you see in this image this is your region of the uncus some 
gray matter of the uncus has been removed here. So the anterior part of the uncus harbors your amygdala. So you have connections coming from the amygdala that go in the medial forebrain and that go up to the caudate nucleus that I will show you in, that I've already shown you. That is the stria terminalis, that is the dorsal amygdalofugal pathway. And this one is your ventral amygdalofugal pathway that connects the amygdala going all the way to the interhemispheric region and the subcalosal region and to the septal nuclei. There are also a couple of other pathways that come here. That is the ansa lenticularis and ansa pedunculares that connects the amygdala to the brainstem. So now the entire extent of the anterior commissure has been dissected here. Here you can see some gray matter still of the basal nucleus and the substantia innominata. Now the anterior commissure is a bow shaped structure that you see here. It resembles a bicycle handlebar. This, but it also has a frontal connection and a temporal connection. The frontal connection of the anterior commissure is generally very small and it runs just beneath the gyrus rectus going all the way to the olfactory tubercle. So this frontal portion of the anterior commissure connects both the olfactory regions of the frontal ropes to each other and the posterior extension of the anterior commissure connects the temporal lobes of each hemisphere to each other. This anterior commissure was very strong and it formed a prominent commissural connection in lower mammals and in reptiles. But as we have evoluted, the anterior commissure has thinned down and basically its functions are now related to emotion and related to carrying sensations of vision, olfaction and gustatory stimuli from one lobe to the other. This runs in a very thin, very prominent canal. That canal is called the canal of gratiolae. It runs right up to the globus pallidus. So now this is your inferior view of the anterior commissure. As you can see here, superiorly, it is very closely related to the anterior limb of the internal capsule. This is another better image showing the relation of the anterior commissure to your anterior limb of the uh, internal capsule. And this structure that you see here are fibers of the IFOF and ancinet as they're going to form the lateral portion of the temporal horn of the temporal lobe. And this is your optic tract as it's running around the cerebral peduncle going, to, going into the lateral geniculate body. So what happens is the anterior commissure when it comes to the Lyman insulae, it goes in front of the globus pallidus. So once you remove the putamen and you see some portion of the globus pallidus here, just the anterior and inferior portion of that will be your anterior commissure. And it goes here, just posterior to these fibers of the IFOF, you have the fibers of the anterior commissure, and then you have fibers of the optic radiation, and all of them combine together from the sagittal to form the sagittal stratum. It is called stratum because it is a series of fibers which consist of the IFOF, the anterior commissure fibers, fibers of the optic radiation, and also fibers of the tapetum from the corpus callosum as it covers the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. So this is another image showing the entire extent of the anterior commissure. As you see, this is the frontal portion. This is the temporal portion. And you can now imagine that it is going posteriorly. And basically, it is hugging both the temporal lobes, as you can see here, because it fans out in the temporal region. Here it has a thin arm, it fans out in the temporal region and hugs both the temporal lobe, encompassing, encompassing them completely. This is how it is. This half of it has been cut and you can see the anterior commissure traversing and going in the lateral aspect of the temporal horn. This is again your substantia innominata and your ventral striatum. So this was your third loop, the third loop of the limbic system. So now you have this region, as I was telling you, the septal nuclei. So this is your subcalosal region. Now the cingulate gyrus very consistently connects with the gyrus rectus, and this is your region of the cingulate pole. The gyri in front of this are the paraolfactory and the paraterminal. This is the paraterminal, and this is the paraolfactory gyri. This region is your subcalosal region, and this is the region of your septal nuclei. This layer is your septum pellucidum which is just a thin layer. There are no neuronal cells here. So this is basically known as the septum vergae or the true septum. And this is just your septum pellucidum. So now you have not understood the connections of the limbic system. So you have this connection here that is going all the way. This, this region is also known as the prehippocampal rudiment. And it's going all the way about the corpus callosum and going to the temporal lobe in the hippocampus, as you have seen. 
then you have the papage circuit that is continuously connecting and then you have this connection between the medial forebrain medial basal forebrain and the amygdala so there are three basic connections of the limbic system that you have seen and here you can see another image that is showing the parahippocampus gyrus very clearly now to tell you about the development of the parahippocampal gyrus the parahippocampal gyrus when it is there on the when it when you see it on the inferior aspect it turns laterally okay the parahippocampal turns laterally this edge where it turns is called the subiculum this subiculum turns more and it forms the hippocampus and just medial to this again you have the dentate gyrus so the dentate gyrus and the fimbri are separated by a fimbrio dental dentate sulcus i'm not sure if i will i'll see if i can show you in another image and the hippocampal hippocampal formation lies in the hippocampal fissure so all these fissures have been carried down during the process of evaluation as c shaped structures giving the characteristic shape of the limbic system so looking from basally looking from inferiorly now here you have the parahippocampal gyrus this is your fusiform gyrus separated from the parahippocampal gyrus by the collateral sulcus this is your rhinal sulcus this region here the most anterior aspect of the uncus and this region in front of the rhinal sulcus is your piriform cortex what happens to the parahippocampus as you can see here is it turns it turns medially on itself to form the uncus looking at the uncus the uncus has a major anterior part and a smaller posterior part so the anterior part of your uncus harbors your amygdala and the posterior part of your uncus harbors the head of the hippocampus so that is your next important relation the anterior part of the uncus lies in this lies close to the anterior perforated substance in this carotid cistern and the posterior part of the uncus lies very close here to the cerebral peduncle or in the crural cistern and you can see the posterior cerebral artery as it is running close to the uncus and this is a very important relation to remember while operating in this region because you will just have a thin layer of pia that is separating your uncus from this posterior cerebral artery and from the cerebral peduncle so it is important not to damage here now once you remove the gray matter of the uncus so here the gray matter of the uncus has been removed the gray matter of the parahippocampal gyrus has been removed from inferiorly you start seeing this structure here that is your thin where the radiation of the cingulum was ending so you see these fiber bundles here as the cingulum ending in the parahippocampal region so this is the first layer that you will see after removing the gray matter and this is the radiation of the cingulum once you remove that you start seeing the ependyma of the temporal horn so we are progressing from inferiorly towards the temporal horn so you have removed the radiation of the cingulum then you see the ependyma of the temporal horn now you remove the ependyma of the temporal horn and you start seeing the whole hippocampus and here you can see the head of the hippocampus the body and the tail of the hippocampus this nucleus here you can see is the amygdala so imagine you had the uncus here the anterior part of the uncus harboring the amygdala the posterior part of the uncus harboring the head of the hippocampus and this is your choroidal fissure you can see the choroid plexus and it turns went around the thalamus in this region so now again i will remove the hippocampus so now the hippocampus has been lifted and deflected anteriorly and now you just see the choroid plexus the choroid plexus enters a branch of the anterior choroidal artery forms the choroid plexus and it enters this region at the junction of the head and the body of the hippocampus in this area and this is the inferior choroidal point here you can see that it is this is the junction where it enters and that is the inferior choroidal point once you reflect the choroid plexus you start seeing some fibers in this region so if you see here this is your optic tract connecting to the lateral geniculate body and you have fibers originating from here and going all the way to the lateral aspect of the temporal horn and these are your fibers of the mayer's loop so the mayer's loop originates from the lateral geniculate body runs over the roof of the temporal horn and then forms a part of the lateral aspect of the temporal horn so as you can see here we have turned the specimen this is the lateral geniculate body this is the mayer's the loop of the fibers of the mayer's loop as they are turning and they are forming a part of the lateral wall of the temporal horn 
as we know that it is the third layer of the sagittal stratum. So you have the eye for the anterior commissure and the mayors too that is forming the sagittal stratum. Now, if you turn the specimen and see from laterally, so now this is the entire extent of the internal capsule. We have seen this dissection last time. So you have the anterior limb, the genu, the posterior limb, the retrolenticular portion and the sublenticular portion, which mainly constitutes of the mayor's loop. As you can see that the mayor's loop is turning and going posteriorly. And this fiber bundle that you see here is the anterior commissure. And these are your fibers of the IFO. In this region, the globus pallidus has been removed. Now, again, coming back to the hippocampus here, we have seen this image already. Now, what we have seen most of the components of the limbic system. There is one more that is the hippocampal commissure. So basically, the hippocampal commissure is a series of fibers that lie in this triangular area between the crura of the two fornices. So as you can see, these are the two, for, two hippocampal formations on both the sides. And this is your area where your hippocampal commissure will lie. And it lies just beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum. And it is quite, quite nicely stuck to that region. So it's difficult. It, you have to struggle to separate it from the bottom of the splenium. Now, this is another image where you can see the components of the limbic system from a medial aspect. So here in the roof of the temporal horn, you have the amygdala. You have the hippocampus as it is going up. And you have the white fibers around it, that is the fimbria. Here you can see the fornix of the other side coming here and invading into the hypothalamus. This is your anterior commissure. This is your posterior pineal body and your habenular commissure. So now we have seen most of the components of the limbic system. So now if you want to remember this, remember them as three rings. This is a specimen which has been tilted. It is, it is a specimen which image has been taken how it is tilted. So this is your one ring that constitutes the pape circuit, starting here at the hippocampus, which we've already seen, going around the fornix, the mammillary body, mammillothalamic tract, cingulum, and back here. So this is your one circuit, the most important circuit. Then you have another circuit here. Here you have an olfactory tract and the region of the amygdala here, and the basal, fo basal forebrain region and your amygdala region, pyriform cortex, all connecting and forming another circuit here. The main fibers of this circuit is your ventral amygdalofugal pathway, the diagonal band of Broca, the ansa pedunculares. And the main constituents of this pathway is your ansa, is your uh, papage circuit. There is another circuit that comes from the amygdala. I will show you in this image. So now we will understand this complex image better. First, this is the hippocampus. And you identify this circuit here, the hippocampus going as the fornix into the mammillary body here. And then as we know, it forms mammillothalamic tract and continues in the cingulum. So this is your, this is one C. Then you have another ring that coming that comes from the tail of the hippocampus, goes above the corpus callosum as your inducium crisium and comes all the way here in the subcallosal region. So that is one another connection that you have of the limbic system. Then you have connections between your lateral olfactory stri and the region of the amygdala. This is your ventral amygdalofugal pathway that whose main constituent is the diagonal band of Broca. This structure here is your anterior commissure as it connects both the temporal lobes. This region here is your septal region. So you have another tract that originates from the amygdala, runs along with the tail of the caudate nucleus between it and the thalamus, and that is your stria terminalis. And it has your a bed nucleus of the stria and it connects mainly with the septal region. So you have one circuit that is your dorsal amygdalofugal pathway. You have your ventral amygdalofugal pathway. You have your papis circuit. You have another circuit that connects your inducium crisium to your hippocampus. So these are the various components of the limbic system. And also you have a last circuit that connects this region, septal region to the brain stem. It connects by the form of the medial forebrain bundle and by the mammillotegmental tract. So these are the main components of the limbic system that we have to know. Now, the clinical implication of this, where does this most importantly come? It comes when you're operating in the mesial temporal region or when you have to perform amygdalohippocampectomy during your temporal lobe surgery. So the approaches to the mesial temporal region or to the amygdala and hippocampus can be divided into three. 
So you have the lateral approaches from the transcortical area on the lateral aspect of the temporal lobe. Then you have your inferior approaches. As you realize that the fusiform gyrus is very closely related to the temporal horn inferiorly. So that is your another pathway where you can approach the temporal horn from the inferior root. And then you have a transsylvian root that is through the Lyman insulae and through the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula. So these are your three major routes where you can access tumors of the medial temporal region or you, which you use for an amygdala hippocampectomy. So as we have seen last time, this is your region of your insula and this is the region of your Lyman insulae. Now you can see here that it is closely related here to the plenum polare of the superior temporal gyrus. That is the part of the temporal operculum. So we will see how this is relevant. So there are two ways that has been described here. One is through the Lyman insulae, which carries a risk of damage to the temporal stem. And there is another approach that has been described by Yastergil, and that is through the plenum polare of the superior temporal gyrus, which will straight take you to the temporal horn. So another important structure that we have to uh, anatomically know is the temporal stem when operating in this region. There is a very quite a lot of confusion about the nomenclature of the temporal stem. Some people include the medial aspect of the fibers that connect the ventral forebrain to the amygdala also as part of the temporal stem. But most authors, most people agree that these connections that, that connect the most, la most lateral part of the frontal brain to the temporal constitutes your temporal stem. Why is it called a temporal stem? Because if you see a coronal image of your MRI, it represents an inverted tree, which has, which has branched out. And that's why it is called as the temporal stem. And the main constituents of this temporal stem as it runs just posterior to the Lyman insulae and its main constituents are the uncinate fasciculus, as you see here, and the IFOF that is running posteriorly and fibers of the anterior commissure. So this is your IFOF as it is running to form the part of the sagittal stratum. So the approach to the amygdala and the hippocampus through the sylvian fissure. First thing is you have to expose the sylvian fissure very right, widely and go right up to the inferior limiting sulcus that is present here. So this is your region where you will go. This is your Lyman insula. This is your inferior limiting sulcus. So when you make an incision in that region, you will enter into the region of the superior uh, of the temporal horn, but you will transect some fibers of the temporal stem. So there is another ap approach that has been described through the planum polare of the superior temporal gyrus, which if you open and spread, you will straight enter and see the amygdala, and then you will see the body, the head and the body of the hippocampus. The disadvantage of this approach, if you can imagine in this specimen, this is your region of the insula, it has been cut actually, this. This is your region of your olfactory sulcus, olfactory stri, and this is your region of your insula and the inferior limiting sulcus, which if you enter, you will come into the amygdala and the hippocampus. So this is another image where you can see the putamen. You can see here the region of the amygdala, the head of the hippocampus. So if you come from the inferior limiting sulcus, this is how you enter, and then you make your incision here, perform the resection on the base here, and then turn and perform your neocortical resection. The disadvantage of this approach is you do not have a posterior view. You cannot see all the way posterior in this region. So that is one limitation. And the second limitation is you have to dissect through a lot of the sylvian fissure with a risk to the damage of the arteries in the region. So this is another image where you can see the amygdala, the superior part of the amygdala connects to the lentiform nucleus in this region. And here you can see that it is connecting to the ventral striatum. This is your region of your Lyman insulae connecting both the, both the frontal and the temporal regions. This is your head of the hippocampus in the temporal horn. So this was the transsylvian approach. There's another approach that is a use of a supracerebellar transtentorial approach, which can be used, of course, to remove the amygdala and the hippocampus, which you can see in this region. We have also used and described this approach for the first time for resection of a medial temporal tumor an epidermoid, which was in this region. So you retract the cerebellum down and you tra cut the trans transect the tentorium and you get a trajectory to remove this tumor, as you can see. This also has been exceedingly used to remove the amygdala and the hippocampus. 
and the incision is in the fusiform gyrus and you remove the amygdala in the hippocampus. Now we prefer to use the lateral transcortical approach to the temporal and I will show you by, by dissection how and why. So this is your image of the lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere with your bony landmarks. This is your superior temporal gyrus, your middle temporal gyrus and an inferior temporal gyrus. This region here is your pre-auricular depression. Here you can see this depression right at the root of the zygoma is your pre-auricular depression. So when you draw a straight line from here up to the squamous suture, the part where it transects the temporal gyrus is where you have the posterior aspect of the hippocampus. So that is a very important landmark for us to remember when you're exposing the area for the for a amygdala hippocampectomy. So when you do a transcortical approach, Traditionally, people had described this approach going through the superior temporal sulcus, where some part of the gray matter of the superior temporal gyrus was also removed. But we use the middle temporal gyrus approach because we can easily access it through here. And I will also show you another reason why we do this. So this is your middle temporal gyrus. You have removed the gray matter in this region now, and you start seeing the hippocampus here. And more clearly now you see that this is the superior temporal gyrus has been preserved. The middle and the part of the inferior temporal gyrus have been removed. You start seeing the head of the hippocampus here. This is your region of the amygdala. The head of the hippocampus becoming the body and here it runs into, forms the tail. So this transition of the body and the tail typically occurs <coughs> at the lateral mesencephalic sulcus of the midbrain. <coughs> that is another important landmark to remember. So this is your amygdala in the hippocampus. When you see a coronal section, you see that the hippocampal head occupies the middle aspect of the temporal horn. And this is your roof of the temporal horn. And these are the fibers that are running in the lateral aspect of the temporal horn. So now to understand the arrangement and how to avoid injury when you're doing a transcortical approach to the temporal horn, we, know, we have to study these fibers here. As you've seen earlier, these are components of the temporal stem. So you have your eye fof you have your anterior commissure. And then of course, below that you have your optic radiation. So now this specimen is going to be turned. So you see here in the, this area, these fibers are only in the roof of the temporal horn. Here, this, this, this area is devoid of any fibers. And then they form part of the lateral part of the temporal horn posteriorly. So if you see this, there is an area here, which you enter from the middle temporal gyrus you will avoid injury to the temporal, to fibers of the IFOF, to fibers of the anterior commissure and to fibers of the optic radiation. You will straight access the head of the hippocampus and then extending this posteriorly and beneath these fibers, you can easily perform an amygdala hippocampectomy with this approach. You will avoid, and in this region, you will have the amygdala, which can also be removed with this approach. So now to simulate this approach, I have turned the specimen as you see it in the operative view. So. This is the middle temporal gyrus. A cortisectomy has been made in this region. If you remember the craniometry, if you, draw, if you see the root of the zygoma in the pre-auricular depression, this is the point it will correspond to here. So that is where you can make just there or just anterior to that, you can make your middle temporal gyrus incision. You will see the head of the hippocampus and its body and its tail. Now this is the specimen as you go closer. So this is your cut. We perform the cut here at the tail of the hippocampus here, posteriorly. And anteriorly, we go all the way, removing the uncus and the amygdala in this region. We do not cross this line because superiorly, the amygdala connects with the globus pallidus, which you have seen already in previous images. So this is your extent of amygdala hippocampectomy. And extending this incision, you can carry it and remove the neocortex along with it in one complete block. So this is, again, a dissected specimen. As you can see here, this is the region where I said there are no fibers. So now I've pushed the hippocampus up here. You see these fibers in the lateral aspect of the temporal horn. Here in the roof of the temporal horn, there are no fibers. So if you enter from here and then remain below this level, you're not going to cause any visual field deficit to this patient. So this is your amygdala hippocampectomy. And then we use this for, a, we use this similar approach for tumors in the medial temporal region. You see this huge tumor that is going and across the Tentorium and falling across, you can see the major vessels here. This is a completely tumor of the mesial temporal region, basically of the parahippocampal gyrus. You can see here that all the fibers are displaced superiorly. 
the only fiber that you're going to damage here is your inferior longitudinal fasciculus which will come in the way of your incision when you come from the inferior temporal gyrus region but unless unilaterally this tract does not cause any damage it's only bilaterally if you damage it you might have prosopagnosia so in one side there is no problem so you go in from the inferior temporal gyrus and you can see that the complete tumor has been resected using this approach you can see the trajectory here this is another tumor that is in the posterior aspect of the parahippocampus where it turns to join the cingulate here you can see where it turns to join the lingual and the at that junction basically where the parahippocampus joins the cingulum on top and the lingual below gyrus below this is your tumor again by an inferior temporal approach we have used this and got an a very good tumor resection and you can see the fibers in this region which have been displaced superiorly so without causing any problem to any of the subcortical network this is another tumor that is in the basal forebrain and in the region of the uncus and the amygdala so in the ventral part of the limbic system so it is occupying the orbital surface of the frontal lobe posteriorly and the middle aspect of the temporal lobe in this region you can see the tumor here you can see the fibers that will come here the uncinet and you have the ifof and we have approached this tumor from this orbital approach and you can see this good tumor resection that we have done now we have finished all the components of the limbic system but there are some fibers that are also important to the limbic system because you have to traverse the fibers when you are operating in this region especially when you are doing a transcalosal approach or when you have to reach the tumors in the region of the cingulum you will have to avoid injury to these fibers and that is the corpus callosum so once you remove this thin layer of fibers over the corpus callosum you see this five transverse fibers of the corpus callosum as they run and turn laterally to form part of the middle aspect of the corona radiata where they join here you can see these are the fibers of the forceps minor as they form the root anterior part of the frontal horn and the corpus callosum if you have to understand has projections anteriorly that is the forceps minor has projections posteriorly that is the forceps major which we are all aware of then it has dorsal callosal radiation and it has ventral callosal radiation so your dorsal callosal radiation goes medially and connects up to your projection fibers or the medial aspect of your corona radiata and your ventral callosal radiation they come all the way down cover the lateral ventricle they, that you form the tapetum they cover the roof of the lateral ventricle going all the way up to the lateral ventricle temporal horn on the lateral side covering the temporal horn as well and the atrium so basically your corpus callosum is encompassing the whole ventricular system within its ventral radiation and uh, laterally they are limited by the projection fibers so the i view the corpus callosum as a hanging rope bridge where the rungs where the fibers of the corpus callosum are the rungs of your rope bridge and the two structures on the side are your projection fibers as you can see here very clearly so we have published this in our paper on the architecture of the uh, white fibers and i have shown you last time that we have divided them into the five groups so basically your limbic system falls in this this group the deep group of fibers that are there and the cingulum forms a component of the middle group so this is your fibers that you have seen the next thing that you see is when you are operating in the region of the cingulum so when you see on the middle aspect this is your cingulum above it you will have the slf or the middle part of the slf and just beneath that you will have the corpus callosum so this is classically a tumor of the cingulum this is just above the isthmus of the cingulum in this region you can see so you can see that these are the fibers of the internal capsule and the projection system the tumor is medial to it and all the other fibers are lateral to it so the best way to approach this tumor is interhemispheric and this is our craniotomy and after retracting here you can see that the tumor excision has been obtained very without any problems and this is the post op scan showing the tumor resection so to summarize these are your basic connections of your limbic system so basically you have the para, the cingulate gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus connecting to the entorhinal cortex forms from fibers around the cubiculum and the hippocampus forming the fornix and the mammillary mammillothalamic tract going to the anterior thalamic of nucleus again forming the anterior thalamic radiation and going up to the cingulum and coming back as component of the papay circuit you have another you have other systems that are not in seen in this image that you've seen in the previous image that connects the amygdala to the ventral striatum 
that connects the amygdala to the septal region and also that connects the subcalosal region to the hippocampus, uh, hippocampal formation. So these are your basic connections of the limbic system. And these are your limbic connections between the telencephalon, the diencephalon, and the mesencephalon. You have the stri medullaris, basically, which connects the septal nuclei to the habenular nuclei. You have the fasciaris retroflexus that connects your habenular to nuclei to this midbrain. And you have the medial forebrain bundle, which connects the septum to the midbrain tegmentum. So this is your limbic system. And I hope I have made, made you understand something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhida, for your brilliant presentation. Really excellent. Uh, you are just inside your presentation. There is There was no way to distract ourselves from the presentation. It was so fluent and very live streaming. Really attractive. I think uh, a lot of questions uh, in chat box also, and uh, I've got panelists also. First of all, uh, I would like to request uh, my monitor, uh, Sir Professor Shafiq Islam, sir, just put some comment on this brilliant presentation. Shafiq uh, same here. Thank you, Professor Avidra, for a uh, beautiful talk. It is a really a wonderful talk from uh, Dr. Abida. Thank you. Uh, you know, white fiber dissection is always something you need to learn always, all the time. Otherwise, you will forget. So, it is wonderful. It's a great learning curve for us, for young neurosurgeons. So, my question is based, based on your uh, experience in white fiber dissection and Amagdala hippocamping to me. What is your and Professor Goyal's preferred approach for visual uh, temporal epilepsy surgery? I showed you the approach. It's the middle temporal gyrus approach, transcortical approach to the middle temporal gyrus. Make an incision in the middle temporal gyrus. Enter the temporal horn beneath the roof of the temporal horn. Remove the amygdala in the hippocampus in block. Then come posteriorly, disconnect the tail, and then go up to the neocortex and then remove the whole thing as in one block. So that is the approach we use. So how you determine your superior end of the section near uh, amygdala? So the amygdala, the superior extension is a line that you draw from the tail of the hippocampus, just above the lateral part of the temporal horn and just at the margin between that. Because if you go too superiorly, you will enter the globus pallidus. So that you learn by experience. There is not a very demarcated line or boundary that I can give you, a landmark. But once you start doing it, you will realize where the boundary is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. I have a, a complimentary question over this uh, amygdala hippocampectomy. Just yes. after entering into the uh, lateral uh, uh, temporal horn, uh, we are resecting the, uh, the hippocampus. How far we should resect posteriorly? How can you guess this is my end point of my resection? Can you please tell us? So the end point of your resection is where your hippocampus turns, where the body becomes the tail. So you can see in the lateral horn, you will see that the body is ending there and turning. That is your end point of resection. And this region, if you are if you are seeing the tentorial side, it basically comes at the region of your lateral mesencephalic sulcus. So that is another landmark. But generally, you don't see it. So you have to see it from the temporal horn only. So it is where your body turns to become the tail. Thank you very much. Suresh Nair, sir, is with us. Yeah, I am sir, the out, comment outstanding, outstanding lecture. A few comments only, Abhita. This is from, you know, Chitratirnal Institute of Medical Sciences at, at Trivandrum, where more than 1,500 epilepsy surgery cases have been done. I think people from Bangladesh also have come and visited there, stayed there for some time, learned surgery. So, as Abhita was telling, uh, say approach to the middle temporal gyrus. Uh, say you can come say standard Spencer's procedure where you do anterior lateral temporal polectomy or lobectomy. Then, as she also told from the Sylvian fissure under the inferior limiting sulcus through the temporal stem, and also there is another approach through the choroidal fissure. But what I want to tell you. Through the say, if you approach through the middle temporal gyrus, you are going perpendicular to the body of 
hippocampus it is very difficult to see posteriorly so the approach the best approach is for all youngsters you do spencer's procedure so you give 15 degree tilt to the opposite side and then extend the head around 20 30 degrees you are going parallel to the hippocampus you can see where the tail body is turning to the tail you can take out everything that is how that uh, approach outscores all the other approach middle temporal gyrus by the time you go perpendicular to the body of hippocampus by the time you go posteriorly you would have damaged so much of the neocortex so best is to take out 3 3 and 1/2 cm of either side neocortex anterior lateral temporal prolectomy and then have a trajectory parallel to the hippocampus it will least uh, hurting to the patient uh, but as abida told you know i for uh, and uh, uh, all, the, all this uh, mayer loop and other thing injury will be less if you go through middle temporal gyrus but you damage so many structures because your approach is perpendicular to the uh, body of hippocampus you have to go posteriorly unless you take out the hippocampus in toto patient won't have good outcome this is from chitrathirunal institute at trivandrum okay thanks abida great talk thank you sir thank you uh, it's a complimentary question there are uh, so many debates on selective amygdala hippocampectomy or temporal lobectomy with amygdala hippocampectomy and so somebody says uh, the amygdala hippocampectomy selectively if we do then uh, less uh, morbidity or less sense of complication and somebody argue that uh, the less uh, alleviation of uh, the disease process or or epilepsy so well, what do you feel which one is better selective or temporal lobectomy Abida, asking me? Oh, I thought you asking. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's better to remove the neocortex along with the amygdala and the hippocampus because we have seen in our experience sometimes we have done a selective amygdala hippocampectomy and the patient still has some seizures. So we are doing a combined dissection. We are removing both the amygdala hippocampus and the neocortex. Yes, sir. Now, now, now there are also uh, we are doing it with EKG guidance so that you know you. uh inside in the or you see where the uh waves are coming in and you resect that portion also yeah always in cases of dysplasia or some you know some small tumor in this region so that time yeah. you do a ekg guided resection always ekg guided resection only but uh, uh, to me you know what abida was telling uh, through the middle temporal gyrus probably if you are if you have to take out the whole hippocampus you have to be extremely good surgeon and uh, going through a small incision there and then going to the uh, temporal horn and then from that uh, perpendicular axis you have to go again remove whole of hippocampus it is difficult for a beginner i think spencer's procedure best procedure and abida i i, I am also little confused as what is temporal stem and my understanding is whatever beneath the inferior limiting sulcus to the roof of temporal lobe whatever come there you call it temporal stem from the uh, below the inferior what? yeah it will include everything what we have told that is that is what is now being believed but there are some somewhere i have read before that temporal stem where this all this uh, diagonal band of broca ventral amygdala fugal tract they include that also in the temporal stem but not technically nowadays temporal stem is the one that is just beneath the lymen insula so that is the temporal stem um can i ask you a question sir that is great uh professor uh shah can i ask you a question yes Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for this great presentation. That is actually a superb one. Um, it's one of the top most difficult um, topics to uh, to explain in neuroanatomy, and you did just great presentations in a very confined way. Actually, I, I would ask you, what is exactly the boundaries for the selective hypo, uh, um, amygdala hypotomy? 
um, there is that new um, surgeries for the selective hippocampus amygdalectomy. So would you briefly explain what is exactly the boundaries for this selective operation? Selective amygdala hippocampectomy yeah. means you do not remove neocortex. You just go through a transylvian approach. You go either through the superior temporal gyrus and you remove the part of the amygdala and a hippocampus or you go through the Lyman insulae and the inferior limiting sulcus and again go into the temporal non and remove that. When you're going through the transcortical, that will be a little difficult because you will damage the uh, some part of the cortex. If you go from inferior, if you go from the fusiform gyrus, also you can do a selective amygdala. Basically, if you only remove the amygdala and the hippocampus, that's a selective amygdala hippocampus. If you remove neocortex along with it, then it is a temporal lobectomy along with the, along with the amygdala hippocampus. And you still do the non-selective one or the complete amygdala hippocampus? Did you, so did you find any difference between the selective one and the non-selective one and the outcome? From our experience, from our outcomes, we prefer to remove the neocortex also, not just do a selective amygdala hippocampus. That's for better control of the seizure, right? Yes, better control of seizure. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Avidam, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes, go ahead. I mean, third year, uh, third year recent, ma'am, from the anatomical aspect, I have a question. That if I visualize the temporal horn, what would be the uh, orientation of the components of the uh, limbic system with relation to the choroidal fissure? You, from where are you seeing? From which part of the brain are you from seeing? Medial from medial to lateral aspect? aspect? From medial to lateral aspect. So from medial to our lateral aspect, you will first have the thalamus, then you will have the choroidal fissure, then you will have the fornix, and the hippocampal portion of it in the temporal horn. And then you will enter, then you will have the temporal horn. I, I mean, I want, to I want to know, I mean, ma'am, actually, uh, I have a confusion uh, when I see it in the uh, rotor microanatomy. I mean, what is the uh, up and down level and the orientation of the hippocamp uh, parahippocampus, the dentated gyrus, and also the fimbria? With relation to the choroidal fissure. So the choroidal fissure, you understand I mean, first, is running all the way between the fornix and the thalamus. Okay, if it is running between okay. these two structures. Okay, so we forget the superior portion. We come to the inferior portion. Okay, so your choroidal fissure okay. is separating from inside your hippocampus with the thalamus, your fim fimbria and hippocampus with the thalamus. So when you see from medial to lateral. The parahippocampus will turn like that, become the subiculum, which will again turn to become the hippocampus. And again, on its medial aspect, you will have the dented gyrus. Thank you, ma'am. And another question is, in case of uh, uh, the uh, No, I can't hear you. Well, maybe go on to the next question. Okay. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, the the duty internet connection, I could not uh, uh, make you hard about the question. My question is: Is there any role of attacking the anterior commissure as well, along with the uh, uh, amygdala and the hippocampus, in case of uh, mesial temporal articulation? No, you avoid. Why you want to transect, transect the anterior commissure? You avoid transecting. But if you are coming through the temporal stem, you will take some fibers of the anterior commissure. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Abita, I'm Mathuri here. Yes, sir. I'm, it's a really a great talk, and uh, all neurosurgical community is proud of you, my dear. Thank you, sir. And uh, you, are, you are the sun who is, uh, say, the emanating the sun rays all over. That's what I'm telling. Thank you and very much. What I want to tell you is that can you make a dissection like that as uh, Dr. Ali Christ has demonstrated the dissection of the governor's sinus and try to have a webinar like that. So step by step, you are going to start right from the craniotomy, then going into that area, then going to that area. And that's the portion you demonstrate and that's how you remove. And that will give the answer to what Dr. Suresh Nair had been raising. 
I think that will be a better thing, and we should accept his idea also on all things which he has gathered the knowledge uh, with so many experiences. So we should come out with the approach which is least traumatizing to the brain, the normal brain, and we reach to the area and we remove the neocortex, which is mandatory to be removed to achieve the best result in the ep epilepsy. Yes, sir. The second question which I want to ask you is, I'll tell you if, uh, say, this whole talk is almost dedicated to Professor Bala Subramaniam, if you remember his name. He was the person who has the largest number of psychosurgery in the world. Uh, he was one of the three, four pioneers neurosurgeons in the country. He contributed a lot to the psychosurgery. What are the clinical uh, applications of this all dissections which you have made to the psychosurgery? That's what I want. We were so focusing on epilepsy. Yeah. I'm talking of psychosurgery. So I don't have too much experience with functional, but sir, the connections that are at the ventral striatum are the ones that have to be severed for your psychiatric, for your psychosurgery. So your connections between your amygdala and septal nucleus, connection between your amygdala and your, and your hypothalamus. So those connections at the base of the forebrain and the connections of your near the basal nucleus, those have to be severed and with the anterior commissure for your psychosurgery. I don't have not done functional. Uh, so. I, I, I think you should try and work on that. Okay, sir. That is going to be a great thing because now we have got uh, so many modalities available with the osteotaxy. We have got things available with the brain, deep brain stimulation. We have got the things available with the gamma knife. So there are so many things available. And, uh, and you know that it's a, it's a great subject in its own. Yes, sir. So since you have started this section, so you should be doing much more than that. Yes, sir. Again, I admire Atul and his team and specifically you. And you are really emitting the light to everybody. And next time, try to focus on dissecting right from the craniotomy to the inside and have a long webinar to teach everyone. Okay, okay thank sir. you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think uh, another question uh, from uh, Lakshmi. Lakshmi, can you hear us? Uh, uh, please go ahead with, with your question. Yeah. Uh, can I ask the question, Professor Shah? Yes, go, go ahead. Uh, during resection of the amygdala, the uncus region, as well as the hippocampus, what are the structures that we are to be very careful around? And uh, secondly, are all the resections of these structures done en bloc or is it partial? So, see, as Dr. Suresh Nair was saying, that when you begin, maybe you should remove the neocortex first and then go and remove the amygdala and the hippocampus. How we do it is we enter into the temporal gyrus and we, uh, we, have, we have been performing it and we are quite adept at it. We remove everything with the uh, amygdala, hippocampus and the neocortex as one complete block. So there are the structures that you have to be careful of when you're entering, you have to be careful that you don't injure the sagittal stratum and the optic radiation. So that is at the beginning. And at the end of your resection, when you're at the medial aspect, so you do not transgress your pile border. Because if you transgress that pile border, you're going to have vascular injury because of the injury to the PCA, or you might hit the brainstem, that is the cerebral peduncle. So that is the basic in danger in this amygdala hippocampus. hippocampus. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think another question in the chat box from Shakil Tanvir, Dr. Shakil Tanvir. Can you ask your question, Dr. Shakil Tanvir? Yes, sir. Please. Go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm asking a question about uh, what is the role of the midbrain uh, in case of uh, limbic uh, system? And what is the effect of the, uh, if any injury to the Midbrain, which will be a uh, 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 the feature of injury of the limbic See, system. The connections, the, the connections of the limbic system to the midbrain have been studied by silver by stains by special stains by silver degeneration studies. That they have been identified. Some tracks have been identified. Basically, their connections yes. to the septal nuclei to the midbrain region. 
So I'm not sure, but if you damage that, maybe you can have some effects like effects of arousal and stuff like that when you are when you damage that portion. But you are never going to go into that much depth of the midbrain when you are operating surgically to severe these connections. If you if you reach that depth, you will have other deficits along with that. That this is not going to be a significant part of the deficit. Oh. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Sir, uh, Shafiqul Islam, sir, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Now, can I ask you a question again? Yes. yes. Hello. Yes, sure. yes. Just wanted to know what is your protocol in your center? How do you select phases of hematological hippocampus? How do you select? So we observe if they come with the initial presentation and if they are okay with and on anticonvulsants, we just observe. It's only when they are intractable after two anticonvulsants for more than six months, then we go ahead and operate. Earlier we used to wait for three anticonvulsants, but now we have changed the protocol a little bit. And we, if it is intractable with two anticonvulsants with a good compliance, then we go ahead and do this. To operate on these. Then you do MRI volumetric study? Yes, yes. We do MRI, we do DTI, we do all those things. Thank you. We I have a epilepsy uh, protocol only for the MRI sequences. I think uh, Dr. Musanna Ashfaq uh, has got a question. Uh, Dr. Musanna, can you go ahead with your question? First, introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. And ask you. Sir, uh, uh, good, uh, good evening, madam. I am Dr. Musanna. I am a resident of uh, neurosurgery in Dhaka Medical College Hospital. Uh, I am attending your lecture uh, for the fourth time, madam, and I am learning uh, new things every time in this lecture of limbic system. So, uh, sir, there are three things uh, that came to my mind uh, every time. So what is your idea about the asymmetry of, of uh, white fiber system? Uh, do you think that if uh, there is any asymmetry of the same person between two cerebral hemispheres in white fiber system? Uh, second one is, is there any remote possibility of uh, dominance of white fiber system? And the third thing is, uh, do you uh, think how much endurance can a uh, white fiber tract can endure in case of a tumor. So how much pushing can it endure before it causes any damage to the uh, neurology of the patient? Thank you, madam. To answer your last question first, the white fiber tracts can endure quite a lot of, they're quite resistant. And unless the tumor is really invasive, they will just get displaced and not get damaged. So if you do operate and remove the tumor without damaging, there is a chance of improvement. That is your first question. Your second question was uh, dominance. Uh, so functionally, yes, functionally, there have been some, I, I have, to tell you the truth, I haven't seen it, but functionally, there have been some reports that say that one side, the track thickness is more on the dominant side, but while dissecting, I have not noticed any difference between the right and the left side. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Abby, we have, we have quite a, a long question. Do you see the question from Chun Fu Lin on the chat? I can read it. If you, can you see that question? I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, okay. Why don't you read that? Because it's a long one to read. The big words there. Sun Fu Lin is with us, possibly. Yeah, can, you see, can you see that question, Mohammed Chun Fu, Fu Lin? Yes. San yeah. Fulini is with us. Uh, she can go ahead with question. Her, yeah, that question. would be nice if you could do that. Yeah. Fulin, can you can you hear us? Mm, Please yes. unmute yourself. Yes. Yes. Fulin. Sorry, go it's, it's go not ahead, actually. Go ahead. It's actually another question. It's just a response to previous uh, participants asking about uh, whether to resect neocortex or not. I'm just trying to let you know that in our experience, if the patient has pure mesial temporal sclerosis, we just do selective amygdalo hippocampectomy, and the result is as good as the cortical amygdalo hippocampectomy. Okay, that's that's okay. But we have we were doing it. We were doing selective some years back, maybe ten years back. But we've changed to complete neocortical resection because we are getting better results with that. Long term yeah, yeah. But, but 
Yeah, I, I want to remind the participants that are not so experienced with the selective amygdala hypocampectomy. You better stick to resection of temporal cortex and uh, amygdala, uh, amygdala and hippocampus because it, it provides more space and it's more spacious and it's easier to, to do the resection. But if you are more confident with your technique, then you can proceed to selective amygdala hippocampectomy for patients without lesions in neocortex. Thank you, uh, Fulin, for your you. uh, valuable comments. Uh, uh, Colonel Alamin Salek sir is with us. Would you please put your comments here? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumanana. It's a very uh, nice talk uh, topic to make it very simpler way, and uh, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, this uh, complex topic has been made easy to understand for the. Uh, the neurosurgeons as well as the residents, and uh, there's nothing to add here. Thanks, everybody, for so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I have a question, Professor Ab Abida. Uh, you have shown that the corpus, uh, uh, the singular gyrus, is in continuation with the gyri recti and the medial aspect of the, uh, yes. the yes. lobe. Uh, so, uh, we, we frequently used to sacrifice uh, the gyra recti during our ACOM aneurysm clipping. Uh, but uh, a patient usually doesn't have any uh, uh, clinical consequences uh, following that. Uh, what is your uh, explanation? There are many other connections. There are many other connections. Just, uh, the, you know, some cortex you remove is not going to cause too much deficit. As always, I've said, that the subcortical damage will cause more deficit than a cortical damage because cortex has the potential of plasticity. One is that. And second is when you're doing an ACOM aneurysm, you're going to just remove a small portion of the gyrus rectus. You might not even go up to the cingulate pole. And there are other multiple connections, so there is not going to be any problem. And uh, what you are removing is, as she has already told, it's a very small portion of the uh, gyrus rectus. And that too, it is tailored as per the size and the neck of the aneurysm. And then you are not going to the portion which is the, the connection she has shown. You are a bit more anterior to that, so it's not going to severe the connections. So that is why we must have seen that after operating the ACOM aneurysms, most of the people take away the, that portion of the gyrus rectus. Still, they do not develop the deficit, the connections which she has narrated. So that's what is the thing. Actually. Thank you, sir, uh, for your valuable comments. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, panelist experts uh, from different continent of the world. Uh, anybody can uh, put your question or comments here regarding this brilliant lecture from Abhita Shah. Anybody, please. You can unmute yourself and talk with us. There's one question from Purva Prasad. What is the seizure-free rate in patients undergoing SAH? And is there any operative step which dictates a better seizure-free outcome? Did you get not, that, Abby? Yeah, I got that, but I don't know this. I have oh, not okay. checked with the seizure-free rate in patients okay. undergoing Okay. One one second. Seizure free rate in patients and you no. Know, see, what we used to do is earlier, we had a small cohort of patients with selective amygdala hippocampectomy, and they came back to us after a few years with some seizures. So we stopped doing that. We did not actually calculate the seizure free rate in those patients. So we've stopped doing it. We've stopped doing a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. So I don't know the seizure free rate. Sorry, can I have some feedback for you? Yeah, of course. Sure. Yeah, here in our hospital, we do, uh, re in recent five years, we do selective amygdala hippocampectomy only, just uh, following Professor Yasar Gill's technique. And our result is uh, for patient with class one seizure free is about 80%. And if you consider angles class one and class two, that's about 97% which is as good as uh, cortical amygdala hippocampectomy. Thank you. 
Uh, any question or comment from uh, the CNW members from Bangladesh? Any residents? Yes, we have lots of time. There's no time limit. Yes. Do you have a question now, Sean? Oh, I say excellent, excellent presentation by Abida. Very complicated limbic system has been presented in a beautiful way. And what she has described about the applied anatomy for both tumors and epilepsy is an amazing. Wonderful to learn for everybody. Whether you do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy or with neo, doesn't make difference. But what she has shown is superb dissection and the anatomy to understand everyone. Also, not only for epilepsy, but also for tumors. Congratulations, Savida. Thank you, sir. I think we had a question from a student from Mongolia. Uh, are you there, Bayam Batsen? Are you there? Can you hear me okay? Perhaps not. Okay, anyone else uh, with a comment or question? Okay. When there is so, so much of uh, uh, input about selective amygdala hippo, hippocampectomy. Dr. Abida. Yes, sir. Uh, I think you should you try and study about that. What were your results earlier when you are doing only selective amygdala hippo, hippocampectomy and now you are doing the neocortical resection. So what are the results uh, in both? That will be a better thing to present. Sir, I'll have to go back and check on those cases because we haven't mm -hmm. done that for the last, I think, 10 years now. But I'll go back and check why we stopped or what happened at that time. Well, that will be a better thing. Well, well, once there is a controversy on that, uh, there are people who are practicing that. Yes, so yes, that yes. will be a better input, actually. Okay. Okay, Mohammed, uh, I think yeah, we're I, all ready to wrap uh, up. Yeah. I have a last question to Dr. Abida. Recently, we are, uh, I'm just doing a too many uh, uh, tumor in the temporal horn. Uh, that means uh, in the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And uh, sometimes this tumor is so, so big, and this even touches the cortex also. So in that cases, uh, wh what should we do? Should we uh, follow the approaches to avoid the near slope or we should, uh, we should, uh, uh, target the T1 through the, uh, the the cortex, which is less thick or uh, easy to approach the tumor. For any tumor, you try to avoid, select a route that causes the minimum damage. That is one. Second is if it is coming right up to the cortex, especially inferiorly, where there is nothing, you can easily make a small cortisectomy and go in. So it actually depends where your tumor projects it. But while operating, remember always, that select the least invasive trajectory and the shortest trajectory. So that will give you an answer always. It's different for every tumor, it's different. You avoid injury, you avoid going through any major structure, but again, it depends on where the tumor is and how it is projecting. Okay, very good, Abby. I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, uh, I, I hope you like your studio. I don't know if people realize it, but you've been given your own personal studio do you yeah. know we can give we can give that a password that studio so you okay. can you can have private uh, private lectures on that studio if you'd like and, and okay. i'll show you how it works uh and i'd like to thank all the panelists for coming before we end i'd like to introduce Rushab. Uh, he's a neurosurgical resident neurosurgical resident from india he's contemplating starting a residence channel are you there Rushab? yes yes i'm yeah, go, online Take the floor, uh, and, uh, tell, introduce yourself and tell us what you have in mind. Yes, so uh, thanks a lot, John, for uh, giving me this opportunity to introduce one idea. I'm a resident from uh, Mumbai, from Sion Hospital. Uh, it was a fantastic lecture uh, by Dr. Abida. I'd like to thank her for taking out so much of time, for preparing so much of stuff for residents like us. It's just an idea wherein I want an opinion from all the panelists as well as the uh, attendees. If we are to start a neuro-residence channel wherein the resident has an interactive 
chance to give his presentations regarding anatomy or lectures presentation be it uh, you know neuro radiological thing or an approach to a case be it a journal club would it be helpful and would it be interactive in the way that it helps uh, the residents from all over the world come in contact with people one secondly uh, i'd like to have opinion from the res- uh, senior most people even mathuria sir if they will be willing to chair in some sessions which will help them to correct the residents so that while appearing for exams or for competitive tests it helps them you take me granted for any teaching purpose any time the time should be convenient of yours not mine except sure, sure, that sure, i have sure. not scheduled any surgery at the time otherwise i am available all the time even at midnight early morning any time no problem and the resident teaching program according to me what i always say we should try and get the best possible everywhere in the world the resident teaching program get it from the uk get it from us get it from the uh, other countries that side and our own countries in uh, bangladesh pakistan and our own country try to develop evolve the best teaching program for the neurosurgical residents in the country and that is to be followed for all the places at as far as means okay. concerned i am available i'll try to get more people recruited in that no problem okay what okay. i can, what i can Thanks, suggest sir. is that we we have a meeting uh, just set up a set up a time and i'll announce it and we'll have a meeting like this and see what happens does that sound okay yes yes i would like to have an opinion from uh, if uh, dr abidasha is still present on the panel yeah i'm here i'm here yeah go ahead just go ahead you will be very nicely supported don't worry everyone is there the 100% you will get full support from everyone and that will be good chance for all of you to interact and get to know how you know how things are done at your place at some other place and you discuss ideas it's a good forum it will be a good forum okay thank you ma'am thanks a lot okay we'll be talking and we'll set it up and we'll announce the yes. meeting the first meeting of the residents uh, residence hour or whatever name you want to to uh, get okay thanks everyone for coming and uh, we'll see well i'm going to end the transmission thank you